Holy Ghost. Amen. John the Baptist found waiting hard. As waiting rooms go, his was particularly unpleasant. The Macaris, Herod Antipas border fortress, was perched on a steep-sided hill a few miles east of the Dead Sea. Water is scarce there and the sun beats down intensely. It's been easy for the archaeologists to reconstruct it because once it was abandoned, no one ever thought of living there again. The ancient world had no penitentiaries, places to serve a fixed period of time to atone for one's deeds. There was no parole either. An ancient prisoner was waiting only to face his judge and then his executioner at a hidden moment. It's perfectly understandable that John sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was truly the Christ, or should we wait for another, he asks. It's a grim question and a defiantly hopeful one for a man in John's position. Commentators quarrel about whether John was really doubtful or if he was just giving Jesus an opening to make things clearer for his disciples. But the question John is posing is as much about Jesus' timing as his identity. The prophets clearly promised that God would send a Messiah to set his people free and to establish his perfect kingdom. The Messiah would be a man of both generous mercy and decisive and final reckoning, loved for his grace and feared for his justice. But the fitting together of these promises from the prophets was quite ambiguous. The timeline was TBD, as God would make it clear. John's own preaching, as St. Matthew has recorded it earlier in his gospel, focused on the final reckoning and the blazing justice. The Messiah would baptize with fire, John had said. The ax was already at the root of the trees. The grain was ripe for the harvest, and soon he would beat it out on his threshing floor and shovel the chaff into the furnace. But why then was Jesus still miles away on the other side of the Jordan? while John waited in the darkness. John was innocent. He had boldly rebuked sin as God expected his prophets to do. They called him the second Elijah, but God had delivered Elijah and engineered a real firecracker of a shameful ending for Ahab and Jezebel, who had harassed Elijah for his faithfulness. Where is my deliverer, John is asking. When is light coming for me as I sit in darkness and in the shadow of death? If you are the one, John means, are you coming to give me my justice before it's too late? Jesus doesn't answer that question, at least not directly, though he doesn't mock John for asking it either. He commends John's integrity and says that God had sent John to Israel for a crucial purpose. But look at what is happening here, Jesus says. The blind see and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Now John knows the words of the prophets. He would see right away that Isaiah had promised that the Messiah would do just these things. These are the merciful deeds of the Redeemer. Isaac Williams, a great Anglican preacher of a past age, said of these miracles, they contain the manifestation of God to his sinful creatures. They show us what God is, that God is love, else we could not approach him. And if there is anything left in the corrupt heart of man capable of amendment, they must reach it. I am preaching repentance, Jesus is saying to John, As you preached it before me, I am urging everyone to turn to God 
and to know his mercy, I come bearing gifts and shedding hope into the depths of corrupt hearts. But the time of judgment, Jesus implies, has not yet come. Jesus and John both knew those passages from Isaiah that Jesus quotes also contained other promises. Isaiah 35 talks of eyes opened and deaf ears unstopped. But the verse immediately before that contains this promise, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. How John would have longed to hear those words from Jesus' lips. But Jesus does not speak them, at least not yet anyway. The day for that will come when he lays bare all sin and renders to each the justice his deeds have deserved. But that time is delayed. St. Peter, in his second epistle, lays this out more directly to his congregants who were also distressed about Christ's timing. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Since you wait for these things, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the forbearance of our Lord as salvation. The delay is a blessing, really, if only we could see it, And our waiting is not wasted time, for who among us is without spot or blemish? Are we really at peace with God and with one another? If there is still time to repent, that is surely good news for those like us, who are, as our colleague says, sorely hindered by our sins. But still, it's a hard word for a man waiting in prison for his rescuer Maybe John still dragged those chains over to his cell window every morning to look out and see if it might not be today. John died a martyr's death, a witness to the one in whom he believed, even though he did not see him do all he had expected. This is how it is sometimes for all of us, The people we ask God to heal sometimes don't get any better. Churches led by good people doing just the right things shrink or fold entirely. The relationships we ask God to mend might always stay broken. Tyrants still oppress the weak and the hungry fall in the streets. And often it seems downright unfair that God should delay his justice so long that his timeline remains TBD, or at least hidden from us. But still, God is merciful. He does great deeds in our own time as well. When the Islamic Revolution broke out in Iran in 1979, there were 500 Muslim converts to Christianity. Today, in spite of harsh repression, there may be as many as 800,000, or maybe a million. The number of Anglicans in Angola has increased fivefold in the last 15 years. Christian activism against human trafficking has been remarkably successful. And we're living in the midst of a renaissance in art and film that takes our faith seriously. All over the world, by the hands of our brothers and sisters who go out in Jesus' name, the hungry are fed. The sick are healed, the vulnerable are protected. Amazing opportunities are open wide for the poor. Now, all that good news can seem very far away and beside the point when things just seem to be losing ground in our own lives. But for us, too, God's forbearance is salvation. We are not given crystal clear answers to all our questions. There's still room for doubt, but God is certainly at work, and he who now extends mercy will at the proper time also judge, vindicate, and establish forever. The questions will all be answered, and all the longings fulfilled in ways beyond what we can ask or imagine. 
For now, there is good work to be done and enough light to see how to do it as we watch for him who is surely coming. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our concluding prayers this morning. A prayer, a hymn of the Orthodox Church in honor of St. John the Baptist. The memory of the